Well, good morning, everybody here in the auditorium. Good to see all of you. If you're watching us online or you're in the atrium, welcome to you as well. And John said, we're in the middle of a series called Five Words That Can Change Your Life. And each week, we look at one word that's so powerful it could change your life in 10 days. I just made up the 10 days part. I think that's the time frame. No joke, these are powerful words. The word this week has the power to change you, your relationships, and every person that you say it to. And it is a simple two-syllable word that is very hard to say when we've just done something bad. Just like it's hard to swallow a jagged little pill, it is hard to spit out the word sorry, especially when we've just caused harm and we know we have and we're ashamed. So what I hope, what I hope to do this week is break sorry into smaller pieces that are easier to manage. See, there's a good reason why it's so hard to admit our faults and why our apologies can do more harm than good. And that's because it takes some prep work to do a good job with sorry. But it is doable and powerful, and it's worth it. So let's look at how to unleash the power of sorry. And there are some message notes there in your program if you want to follow along on how to unleash the power of sorry. And I want to stay by, start by saying that before we can make amends, before we can make a good list of those that we've harmed, before we ought to apologize, before we can even become willing in our hearts, before we can be direct and kind with a skillful apology, we have to be good at forgiveness. This is so important. I want you to turn to the person next to you and say, you have to be good at forgiveness. Go ahead. And if you don't like what they just said, just say, stop telling me what to do. <laughs> we have to learn to forgive from the heart. That's the first thing. You can write that down if you want to. Forgive from the heart. And what I mean by from, from the heart is we have to become naturals at it. And I think we all agree that forgiveness is a beautiful idea until we have to give it. An aunt once told me, Katie, you will not catch me getting upset. I just take things as they come. I don't ever hold a grudge, not even against people who have done things to me that I will never forgive. I thought, that's quite a technique. <laughs> and then I saw this on a company bulletin board. To err is human. To forgive is not company policy. In case you wonder if there are workarounds for what I'm going to talk about today, that's the workaround. <laughs> there are lots of jokes about forgiveness. But forgiveness is not something to take lightly because it's essential for our well-being. It's medicine that you need to be healed of any emotional wound. And forgiveness is powerful enough to heal emotional pain and anxiety, and it will usually have a physical healing effect as well. And forgiveness also has the power to free us from compulsive behavior. And it's our compulsive behavior that gets us into the trouble where we need to say we're sorry in the first place. And we know that one of the roots of compulsive behavior is pain, emotional pain, that that we're aware of and also that that we bury. Have you ever had a time when you needed to manage pain, manage intense pain? Did you ever break a bone? Have you ever had a migraine headache? Anyone ever manage the pain of a 24 to 36 hour labor and delivery without the aid of anesthesia? And how do you feel when you're managing pain? How do your emotions feel? I would use the word frayed. That's kind of how I feel, just frayed. And has anybody ever had the experience of being lashed out at or attacked by someone who's trying to manage pain? And my point is that sometimes when we harm others, it's because we've been in a negative emotional state. And that's why forgiveness will help you clear the decks and get ready to say, I'm sorry. And so we want to make forgiveness a natural part of life. And I'd mentioned that making it a habit to accept God's forgiveness is one of the keys 
It's got to be a habit. It's got to be a natural that we accept God's forgiveness. Are you open with God about your faults and your patterns of misbehavior? If there are teens in the room sitting next to their parents, you're probably thinking, this is awesome. (laughs) And it is awesome. When we're younger, we get told about our faults and our patterns of misbehavior. We have to account to them, to our parents all the time. But the truth is, this is something we should be doing in our lives for all of our lives. It is awesome. It is. Do you talk to God, everyone in the room, about your faults? And when you have those conversations with God, I hope it includes God speaking back to you, saying things like, you're forgiven and free, and I understand, and I love you, and keep living. I hope your conversation goes like that. I hope it does. Or perhaps you've given up on having those kinds of talks with God or never even tried because you're trying to handle it yourself. You're trying to do better. And maybe you've given up because you think you are a lost cause. I don't want to speak to that group for just a moment. I know a pastor who once visited a woman who was dying of AIDS. And she contracted the disease through her lifestyle of drug use and unprotected sex. And she asked the church to send someone. She wanted to come clean. She wanted to talk about her guilt. And when the pastor got here, she admitted, I am so lost and I have ruined my life and I have ruined many people's lives. And I know that there's nothing God can do for me now. I'm just sorry. And the pastor looked around the room for some sign or symbol of who is this person I'm having this conversation with. And he saw a picture on her dresser. And there was a face of a beautiful young woman in the frame. And he said, who is the, who's the woman in the picture on your dresser? And she said, well, that person is my daughter. She's the only beautiful thing in my life. She's the one thing that I've done right. And the pastor looked at her and he said, would you help her if she was in trouble? Would you forgive her if she wrecked up her life, if she hurt you and asked you to forgive her? Would you forgive her? Would you love her no matter what? And the woman said freely, of course I would. Why would you even ask me that question? And he said, because God has a picture on his dresser too. And your face is in that frame. And the way that you feel about your daughter is how God feels about you. And he loves you even more completely than you can love your daughter. Can you accept God's forgiveness? Have you seen the extent of God's love and mercy in the actions of Jesus? That was when he was on the cross, when he was being mistreated, he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And just before he died, he said, it's finished and it's complete. And God doesn't ask us to pay that price or suffer like that. What God asks of us is that we accept and receive God's gift of forgiveness as the final word on the matter of guilt and shame. And if you make accepting God's forgiveness a habit in your life, you can unleash the power of sorry accepting God's forgiveness. Another kind of forgiveness is forgiving others quickly. This is part of it. Make it a habit to forgive others quickly. This type of forgiveness is a process, and we can learn it. It can become natural. We can practice. We can get skilled until forgiving others is a natural part of our life. And we have to have this because to be truly free, we have to be able to let go of the resentments of what people do to us every day. They're going to bring unwanted pain and abuse and thoughtlessness into our lives constantly. This kind of forgiveness is about letting go. Do you remember playing tug of war on the playground in elementary school? You got two groups pulling on the rope. They're at war. If you let go of your end of the rope, when you forgive others, the war is over. No matter how hard they may tug on their end, if you've released your end, it is finished. But until you release it, you're a prisoner, prisoner of war. And letting go is a skill. It's actually hard to learn it. We learn it through practice. 
And we learn it through God giving us peace every time we do it. And if you don't know how you need a coach or a sponsor at CR or a wise friend that you can start to talk to about what you're feeling so it can reduce your anxiety and you can let go. And you can do what Paul teaches in Romans 12. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what's right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. And this is hardest if we've been a victim of serious abuse. Sexual abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse, or neglect as a child. And if you've suffered that kind of pain, we don't take your struggle lightly. We hurt with you. I'm sorry. And I want you to find the peace and freedom from your perpetrators that God wants you to have. And you'll receive that through forgiving them and letting go. And remember that forgiving them in no way excuses them for the harm that they caused, but it will release you from the power that they have over you. And then one more thing about forgiveness I wanna mention. We have to have a habit of forgiving ourselves. Can you forgive yourself? Maybe you can forgive others, accept God's forgiveness, but you're so disappointed in yourself or you're so hyper-responsible feeling you need to fix and improve yourself that you don't have the habit of resting on God's forgiveness for little things and big things. Little things like spilled milk and missed appointments and big things like causing divorces. And this is how God wants to address that. God says, come. Come, let us talk it over, says the Lord. No matter how deep the stain of your sins, I can take it out and make you as clean and fresh as fallen snow. Even if you are stained as red as crimson, I can make you white as wool. If you will only let me help. If you will let me. So we have a choice to make. Do we want to stay stuck with our personality flaws and the burden of our past mistakes, or do we want new hearts? There's a saying that whatever you resist persists and it also grows in size. Self-forgiveness. It's not a matter of assigning the blame to another person or letting yourself off the hook. It's not a license for irresponsibility. It's simply an acknowledgement that you're human like everybody else, and you've reached a stage in your spiritual development where you are ready to show yourself respect, the kind of respect that God shows every human being. And it takes some moxie, to use the word sorry. You're going to need some confidence. It takes a strong and a heart, soft heart. It takes a lot of self-awareness because you're going to have to be able to observe yourself in order to see how you trounce on others while at the same time knowing that you're okay. That's balance. And forgiveness will give it to you. Forgiveness is a habit, and you'll need it to unleash the power of sorry. That's number one. Number two is be honest with yourself. We're going to have to be honest with ourselves, brutally honest. Despite the amazing grace that's taught by Jesus, he did not throw out the hard work of making amends. There are two sides to a healthy relationship. One side is grace, and the other side is hard work. And when you get healthier because you're learning forgiveness from the heart, you now need to go back and rectify your earlier wrongs or there will be no healing or better future for you or those that you've hurt. And God forgives us while the spiritual law of sowing and reaping continues. So we have to go back regularly and repair relationship damage that we do. Otherwise, people that we harm will be stuck. They'll be unable to forgive us, and our relationships will be all bent out of shape. And we also need to make amends in order to fully forgive ourselves. Do you remember uh, the story of Beth Bethany Hamilton? Now she's Bethany Hamilton Dirks. She's a professional surfer, and she was in a shark attack in 2003, and she lost her left arm. Well, Bethany was a teenager, and in the recovery from that horrible, brutal physical attack, she started to struggle with feelings of guilt. 
because before the attack, she'd been prioritizing her surfing career over serving others and over her spiritual life. And she didn't find freedom from that guilt until in 2004, she, she went to Southeast Asia and got on the ground helping orphans who were the victim of that horrible tsunami there. And from that experience, she received that emotional healing. It was like she said, I'm sorry to God and to whoever wants to listen for being selfish. And she got, she got relief from that. Amazing grace is not a, a way to avoid working on ourselves or our relationships. It's a way to redo them, to redo them now gracefully and in a way that can liberate both sides. All healers are wounded healers. And there's no other kind. In fact, you're, you're best able to bring healing to another person in an area where you yourself are wounded or you're flawed. Look at 2 Corinthians 4, 7. Paul writes, we are only earthenware, earthenware jars that hold this treasure to make it clear that such overwhelming healing power comes from God and not from us. So when we're honest with ourselves, we learn to say sorry by knowing how much it hurts to hurt. And often this empathy comes from an honest knowledge of your faults and your hurtful actions. And it is usually painful to think about and admit these things. Bill Wilson, the founder of AA, said that we do this thing that's called purposeful forgetting, denials that we've really harmed someone minimizing how bad it was, and we often rationalize our own behavior. There was a man that was traveling down the highway at a high rate of speed, and he got pulled over by a patrolman. And the patrolman looks in the window and says, uh, I clocked you going 85 in a 65 mile an hour zone. And the man said, that's impossible. I never speed. I'm a very cautious driver. I always pay attention to the speed limit. I'm afraid to speed. And he looks over at his wife and he says, isn't that true, honey? And the officer looks in the window at his wife and says, well, how does he do? And she said, he always speeds. <laughs> He's got a lead foot. It's pedaled to the metal all the time. He was flying back there and I was terrified. The guy just glares at his wife. And then he sees the officer is writing a second ticket. He goes, hey, what are you doing? The officer said, you're not wearing your seatbelt. I'm writing you up for that too. The guy goes, I always wear my seatbelt. I always buckle my seatbelt before I start the car. I don't go anywhere without my seatbelt. Honey, tell him. Officer looks at the woman. She says, he never wears his seatbelt. That seatbelt hasn't been used since he bought this car. It's got cobwebs all over it. The guy's infuriated. The patrolman writes the second ticket, gives them both to the guy. The guy tears them up in little pieces. He throws it across the seats at his wife, starts yelling at her. The officer looks in the window concerned. He says, ma'am, does he always treat you like this? Only when he's drunk. <laughs> it's brutal. The truth about our faults and our capacity for blindness. We all do purposeful forgetting, but here's the good news. God is patient, and God reveals our sins to us gradually so that we can absorb what we've done over time. In the book of wisdom, it says, little by little, you, create, you correct those who've offended you so that they can abstain from evil and learn to trust you, oh God. Isn't that good news? It's beautiful. Here's the bad news. Our family and friends are not so kind and patient. They need a clear accounting in order to be free and go ahead with their lives. They just need to talk it through with us. They need to know that we understand what we've done and they want to hear a sincere apology. In my experience, they usually want to agree with me and confirm my suspicions that I have been a jerk. And then I'm sorry that I said I'm sorry. It's hard to be honest with yourself and other people. 
But there's a simple program for moving forward from forgiveness and honesty with self, and it's found in the 12 steps of recovery. We use them here at CR. Step eight's up on the screen, and we're going to read it together like we would if we went to an AA meeting or CR. Step eight, made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them. All. That's number three, make a list. It's list making time. And step eight says, this is going to be a list of all persons we have harmed. Note it doesn't say those who've harmed us. This plan is divinely inspired. See, God knows that making this list is going to push the addict out of their blind selfishness. AACR is the only kind of support group I know that's willing to be honest enough to just call people out and say, you are magnificently selfish. <laughs> or until you break free of your splendid narcissism, you are never going to be happy. And they are just speaking up for Jesus who said without hesitation that we have to renounce ourselves in order to be happy. Jesus called the crowd to himself and his disciples, and he said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. And one big step in learning to follow Jesus is to make this list. Here's another Jesus saying on the topic. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother or sister is still in the dark. So we need to open up our eyes and make this list and become willing to go back and say, I'm sorry. And Jesus taught directly on steps eight and nine. Jesus said, if you're offering your gift at the altar, in other words, if you're in a worship service like this, and there you remember, a name comes into your mind, you remember that your brother or your sister has something against you. Leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them. Then come offer your gift. Don't everybody get up and leave at once. You see, until our religion becomes flesh and bone, and it has us saying, I'm sorry. It's just a social club or an insurance policy. Until our religion has us saying, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for being competitive with you, for needing to beat you at things, race against you, try and do better, so I have a better position in the world at your expense. I'm sorry for doing that. I can see how much stress it puts in our relationship, and I'm sorry that I'm like that. Or I'm sorry that I'm jealous of you, and I'd really rather see us both miserable than see you out there enjoying that friend of yours or that talent you have or that job that you're so proud of. I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I try to control you. I'm sorry that I can't pay attention to my own self and allow you the freedom that God's given you. It's criminal of me to try and take away your personal freedom by controlling you. Sorry. Sorry I'm impatient with you. The things that bug me about you are absolutely nothing. In fact, to most of the world, those things are good qualities about you, and I don't know what's wrong with me, but I'm sorry I make you feel that way. Until our religion has us saying I'm sorry like that, it's just a social club or an insurance policy instead of Jesus-based radicalism that has the potential to heal. And the first genius of step eight is that it pushes us. And the second genius is that it recognizes how long it might take for us to be willing to make amends to them all. It takes time for wisdom and respect for others to be sturdy enough in our hearts that we even ought to be going and making these apologies. Because to make an apology without the benefit of wisdom and respect is a huge problem. Do you ever have somebody apologize to you and it felt more like the person wanted you to know how spirit-filled they are? Ever have someone use an apology as a stage for talking in more detail about your faults? Or sometimes it takes the form of, I forgive you, but I don't condone your sin. Hmm. There could perhaps be a time to say something like that, but usually it's just code. For I'm on the moral high ground and there's still something wrong with you. 
And by doing that, the sorry person frees themselves while keeping the other one still in bondage. And that's not what sorry's for. Sorry has the power to free us all. But immature apologies are usually just manipulations. Where I'm sorry is trying to free himself or herself while making sure you know you did something to force their behavior. At any rate, we need to do the prep work before we're ready to say, I'm sorry. And we need to accept vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Punishing yourself or another person, it's not our job. And it might take a long time to be willing to make amends. And that's why some people go to step eight meetings for years, where they learn to make lists, but not lists of all the people who have harmed them. That's the normal ego way, and it's a very hard habit to break. It's through being honest with yourself and making these lists with help over time that you're given some new software. It's a program called Grace. It's a new attitude, and it's a new way of thinking. It's called the mind of Christ. And with God's help, you can become a person who, instead of keeping lists of those who hurt you, now easily and freely jots down the names of those that you hurt or you fail, and then you do something radical about it. You make a skilled apology, a skillful apology. That's number four. Make a skillful apology. And this might be a note, or it might be a phone call. It could be a visit could be a meaningful gift or an invitation, or it could be an outright apology. God will show you the best way. God will show you the words. God will give you the best place. God will give you the time. Wait for it and pray for them all, and God will give it. God loves to give that kind of guidance. Look at Proverbs 25. Like apples of gold in a silver setting is a word that is aptly spoken. It is a golden ring, an ornament of finest gold, such as a wise apology to an attentive ear. That's going to be you. Having cleared your heart of the rubble of self-righteousness and fear and defensiveness, you will know what to do. And you probably have someone or something on your mind right now. And when you're honest and you're willing, you should do it. And once you've been honest with yourself and you've made a list and you have become willing, then step nine says you go and make direct amends to such people wherever possible. You could circle that word, direct. It's the key. It means being specific and personal and concrete. No tweets. Email's the worst place to talk about something like this. Worst place. When Jesus wanted to heal someone, he went right into the crowd. He got right among people, and he touched them. Now, if you're in a serious conflict with someone, you might want to keep your hands to yourself. (laughs) But be personal, be present, and be there. And just remember that even if the other person rejects you, you open the door And it's going to stay open unless you close it. And then there's this added insight in step nine. Accept when to do so would injure them or others. And Bill Wilson must have learned the hard way, like all of us, that not everything needs to be told to everybody all the time. Talking to someone about how you harm them will hurt them and hurt you. You want to find another way to make amends, and God will show you. And if you're not sure what to do, talk it over with a wise friend. Well, I want to wrap up by telling a lighthearted story about the power of sorry. Bob Goff is an author, and he's a speaker. He's an activist. And uh, like me, Bob Goff loves his Jeep. But unlike my Jeep, he says that his Jeep is an all-guy, gear-and-metal manifesto of testosterone. Whatever. I can get in my Jeep with heels and a skirt. Well, one day he was driving home from church, and somebody crashed into his Jeep. 
They came from out of nowhere. He had no time to react, and they hit him in the driver's side wheel, and the Jeep flipped. It did a barrel roll. He was ejected right out of the roof of the Jeep, and he found himself sitting in the middle of the street, okay, unharmed, and he saw his Jeep over there 30 feet away, flipped upside down with the engine just racing. And he fantasized for a moment about running over to the Jeep and grabbing his fire extinguisher and putting out an explosion fire. But that didn't happen. Instead, what caught his attention was the other car. He walked over to the other car and there was a stunned driver in the car. He looks in the car and he says, hi, I'm Bob. And this frail, small woman is holding onto the steering wheel and she said, hi, I'm Lynn. And Lynn was really shook up. She couldn't have weighed 100 pounds. And she said, I think I forgot to stop. And that was accurate. <laughs> and Lynn was a truth teller. She said, young man, do you know you went through the roof of your car? And he realized how stressed out she was. And he said, oh, oh yeah, I do that all the time. <laughs> he said, I'm a busy guy and I don't like to open the door and have to swing my leg over the edge. And she was still stressed out. He tried to make like the whole incident was a cool thing. He said, if it was a ride at Disneyland, the, the line would be a mile long. And Lynn wasn't convinced. She was pretty upset. And when they parted ways, she said, you know, they're not going to let me drive anymore. And Bob had empathy because he knows how much it means to him to be able to drive and to have that kind of freedom. So they parted ways. And a few days later, he gets this call on his cell. Hello? But there's nobody speaking on the other end. And then this frail voice just kind of crawls out of the phone and says, Bob, I'm so sorry. And he said, oh, is this Lynn? He says, Lynn, it's okay, really, I'm all right. The Jeep just needs a little bit of paint, and it's all good. It's going to be okay. Well, a couple of days later, she calls again. Bob, I'm sorry. And he said, really, Lynn, I am okay. I'm going to be fine. You don't need to call me anymore. But she did. It just kept happening. And so Bob said he didn't know what to do. He didn't know if he should change his cell phone number. He didn't want to ignore her and not take her calls. So he hatched a plan. And he called the local florist, and he asked them to build a bouquet at least five feet tall. He wanted it to be taller than Lynn. He wanted to make a splash. And he asked the florist to hang around and see her reaction, because he wanted to know how it went. And he put a letter inside the bouquet, and it said, Dear Lynn, it was great running into you. <laughs> now stop calling me, Bob. And he said that the florist said her reaction was awesome. She started to cry, she started to laugh, she hugged the florist, and she never called Bob again. And he writes, Lynn got the message, I was okay. I wanted her to be okay too. I wanted her to forgive herself, to realize we all make mistakes. I'm glad I ran into Lynn. I'm glad she kept calling me too. It taught me something about faith. It taught me that when God is big enough and loves me enough to say he forgives me, I should actually believe him. I mean, I shouldn't keep feeling bad about myself all the time, that I've messed up, because that's ignoring what God said, just like Lynn ignored what I said. When I don't trust God's forgiveness, it's kind of like saying I really don't believe God's that good. Lynn made me think I should stop asking God to forgive me over and over when God made it clear, he already has. The power of sorry begins with accepting God's forgiveness, but it doesn't end there. Through God's acceptance, we become whole and able to honestly examine how we're treating others. We can observe ourselves, and we can start noticing and admitting when we do harm, and we can say, I'm sorry. And when you unleash the power of sorry, it doesn't change the past, but it sure does change the future. It changes your future and also the future of others. And God only knows how you're going to be used as a wounded healer. I can't wait to hear. Let's pray.
And as we bow our heads and close our eyes, I just invite you to pay attention to any names that came to mind as we were talking about the power of sorry. And just to hold that name in your heart before God and say to God, I want to make amends. And I ask for your wisdom, your strength, your power, the kind of confidence that I need to be able to go and do that. And Lord God, I ask that you would anoint each and every one of these lists, every one of these names. You hold these names also. And we pray that you would take our willingness as a step of faith and that you would add to that the power of your Holy Spirit and that you would give us the wisdom and the ability to go be wounded healers and to demonstrate your love in a very important kind of way. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.